Thank you for coming here and braving the traffic on Route 3. As we know how difficult that is to, to move around and get here on time. And I am going to introduce this book series to you tonight. Um, but first, I want to say a little bit about time because I am a time travel thriller author. So I want to make a couple of poignant, maybe not so poignant uh, statements about time. So first of all, time, you know, it passes at the same rate for all of us but we all don't get the same amount of it. And here is a quote from Picasso. It takes a long time to become young. All right, I kind of like that. It makes us think about where we maybe should be going as time goes on. And this is the most important one. And I might need like a very large uh, cigar and a mustache for this one. But no man goes before his time unless his boss leaves first. All right, that's Groucho Marx. All right, so I'm going to tell you about this series, about the historical, mythological, and futuristic background for it. But first, a bit about myself. I'm going to go through one of these slides here. This is the release of the third book in the series, Journey from Delphi. And this completes the series. And what's fun for me is creating this sort of cinematic ending for the three books. And tying up all the plot lines as an author, you're always kind of looking at, at completing the story and all these seeds that you planted early on and then paying it off towards the end. Okay, this is all you really need to know about me right here. Uh, as you can see, that's a uh, ticket from the 75 World Series. And I lived in Kenmore Square at the time and was able to go to this series while I was at Boston College. But uh, I found out that Carlton Fisk was going to be at uh, a convention. And I took that ticket up and I showed it to him. I said, Pudge, look at this. He says, I can't believe you have this. He says, and look at the cost of that game. Six bucks to get into that game. He goes, I, I always, you know, that's why we didn't make any money in those days. You know, I, I always complain to my mother, why didn't you have me 10 years later? I could have really made some money in baseball. And so at the end of it, I asked him, you know, hey, would you sign that ticket for me? And the lady who is running, uh, you know, the, the company that he's signing baseballs and bats for and everything says, no, he can't sign that. He says he can't sign anything that's not associated with the show or this company. And I looked at Pudge and he looked at me and he goes, I'm going to sign it. <laughs> and so he signed it for me and that's how I got it. But uh, that, that is uh, something I wanted to show because in the end, you know, I live in San Diego, but I really have a lot of background in Hingham and in the South Shore. As she mentioned before, I went to Boston College and then to Tufts Dental School and uh, eventually went into the Navy. And, uh, you know, one of our classmates here, there's a few dentists from Tufts here, um, Pete Toyas, went out to lunch in Chinatown one day with his dad, who was a captain in the Naval Reserve, and he kind of laid out this plan. He said, you know, yeah, you can go into private practice or you can do this. You could go in the Navy, go see, travel quite a bit, get a lot of experience. And it sounded great to me, and I was ready for it. So when I had the opportunity to, to uh, get my commission, I got it on board the USS Constitution, which was uh, quite an experience. And then for me, what was even better is uh, when I retired, I had my flag flown over the decks and uh, sort of completed the career. So as I said, I do have a, a long family history here. And, um, you know, I have, I have history in Hingham. My, my grandparents lived here on Hershey Street. Is that right? Yeah. I have my aunt Elaine here, who's here, was a school teacher in Hingham for many decades. And um, my uncle, uh, Fletcher, who was the fire chief of Hingham. And also Wayne. Her, her late husband was a uh, fire captain of Hingham. That's right. So anyway, I have a long family history here, and uh, it's always great to be back. I want to I explain a word to you that everybody knows, but it, it's, it, it has a little bit more meaning for someone like me who lives far away but has all his family back here. And that is the word nostalgia. 
And nostalgia comes from two Greek words. The first is nostos, which means the yearning to return home, and then glios, and I may not be pronouncing this exactly correctly in Greek, but it means the pain of, like in the word neuralgia. So nostos and glios is nostalgia, the pain we feel on wanting to return home. So anyway, it's great for me to always be uh, coming back to New England. Um, my dad um, went into the Navy, and uh, as, as part of World War II, he was on a Navy destroyer. And I'm going to show you uh, this article that was in the Hingham newspaper back then. And it's talking about how he was on the McNair and what they did uh, out there in the Pacific. What I want to draw your attention to is, oh, about three quarters of the way down, her main battery shot more than 6,000 rounds in the engagements at Saipan, Tinian, Palau, and Luzon. And I want to talk about that because 40 years later, his son is on that same island of Tinian. All right? Tinian is the island, if you remember, you remember the movie Jaws. And Quince mentions that he was on the USS Indianapolis and they had just delivered the bomb to the island of Tinian because that's where the airfields were and that's where the Enola Gay took off from. And so the, um, uh, the Indianapolis uh, delivered the bomb, but they were on radio silent, uh, silence and uh, they went out and they got hit by Jap subs, um, by torpedoes. Uh, anyway, what happened is I'm with this Marine Corps group and we're sent to Tinian to, as, a, as really as an ordnance disposal team, because 40 years later, all that stuff is still laying on the ground. All this unexploded ordnance is there. It hasn't been picked up. It's all over the place. And so I'm out there with the Marine Corps group. And we also use, that island is also used for live fire now as well. But part of the time we were there was to go ahead and um, gather up all the ammunition, all the unexploded bombs. One of the first places they actually used napalm was there and uh, blow it all up to get rid of it because there's lots of people that live on this island. It's a trust territory of the United States. But I want to tell you what happened when we first got to this island. Um, we're looking for a place to set up our headquarters. And there's a bombed out Japanese building there. Uh, there's two stories and the basement. The basement's all overgrown with brush. So on the top floor we put our our bunks and the first floor, uh, the floor below that is all the administrative offices. And then down below, each of these battalion landing teams go with a physician and a dentist. So I'm the dentist. And everything that we have is loaded into these crates and uh, suitcases. And so we have to find a place to open up and lay out all of our equipment and, and uh, do what, what we generally do in these places, which is sometimes humanitarian efforts for people who live on these islands. As you know, the Comfort and the Mercy are Navy ships that go around uh, to areas of disaster. But that's what we do. We, whenever we would go to an island, we would take care of the people there. So I'm in this building, and I'm wandering around um, the, which I guess would be the cellar, the ground level, and it's overground with all this brush. It doesn't look like anybody's been there uh, since the end of the war. And the building's full of holes where they, they were shot with shells uh, from uh, out on the sea and maybe the destroyers and everybody else. But also, uh, you know, it was, you know, the Marines landed there and, uh, and attacked these buildings. And so I'm wandering around, I have my flashlight and I'm looking for a place, that, a room that I, maybe I can set up my equipment. And I've shined my light on the wall and there's writing on the wall and it says, Jim Morrison lives. Can you imagine? <laughs> So, uh, you know, some place you wouldn't expect to see that. Uh, somebody had gone there, I don't know. But anyway, that's what we do, is we would do these humanitarian missions and, uh, and at the same time uh, take care of the Marines. So what I want to do now is get into the book series and uh, my background and why I'm kind of interested in historical um, History, mythology, and combining it into this time travel thriller series. I'm involved in uh, the classics department with San Diego State and also University of California, San Diego. And it's kind of fun to, you know, be around um, uh, the professors and just kind of seeing the type of uh, work that they do. 
And you know, I've, I've kind of loved this material for a long time. Uh, they used to have these Rexall grocery stores. You could go in, sit there, look at these classics illustrated comic books. And um, this one on the right, for example, you see the Odyssey, that's from 1950. You can imagine that was probably read by our troops in Korea probably or something like that. But that's where I started being very interested in this time period in mythology. So they have, they have uh, a whole list of these classics illustrated, which I don't, I don't believe are any longer uh, made, but uh, you can find them in, in, uh, in comic book stores or online. But I want to talk about mythology a little bit. You know, uh, mythology I find is interesting because it really reels, it, it continues to reveal a lot about human nature. We know that you know, human nature isn't going to change. Our DNA hasn't changed very much. There's still going to be horrors and there's still going to be great acts of compassion. That's not going to change. And so therefore this mythology, all, all these stories of mythology um, portray all that. And I, I want to say something about this picture on the right again because you see, you see the Cyclops there and he's got this big rock in his hand. And he's, what, he's, what they're portraying is that he's going to hurl it and try to crush that ship. Now during the time when Odysseus and his men are trapped in the Cyclops cave, they keep telling, Odysseus keeps telling the Cyclops, my name is No Man. And so when Odysseus escapes and put out, puts out the Cyclops eye, finally when he's sailing away, he yells to him, and if anybody asks you who put out your eye, tell him it was Odysseus from you know, the island of Ithaca. And that was sort of a, a, something that was very arrogant to do. He was boastful that he was the one that put out his eye. But that kind of worked against him because it just so happens that the Cyclops' father is Poseidon. So Poseidon sends all these storms, causes the ship to sink, he loses all his men eventually, and he gets ended up on, you know, uh, washed up on this island. And so what this speaks about is the issue of arrogance and hubris. We see this in our own time, this issue of overbearing pride or arrogance. And the Greeks, the, the Greeks especially understood that the gods, they felt, did not like arrogance. Because if you were arrogant, that meant you thought you were a god. And that's the last thing a god wants, is <laughs> for if a mortal to think that they're godlike. So it's, it's important to understand this part of some of this mythology is that the, is the Greeks do not like arrogance. And in the end, Odysseus really, um, he, he understands his mortality because when he gets washed up on that island with a priestess, a demigoddess named Calypso, that's where we get that name from, he's there for seven years. And finally, he wants to go home. And he appeals to the gods, let me go home. My wife and my son are back in Ithaca. And the, the, the uh, Calypso says, no, I don't want him to go. I want him to stay with me. He's the only guy on the island and he's mine. And so there's an argument. Finally, Zeus decides, well, we're going to let Odysseus decide. Is he going to stay with you or is he going to go? So Calypso goes to him on the side. Look, if you stay with me, I'll offer you eternal life. Pretty good deal. But one other thing he offers him is, she offers him is also eternal youth. So he's got both of those and he refuses. It's probably the most important part of that epic is that he refuses because in the Greek mindset, you can't be a god, right? You have to know that you have great promise, but you also have limitations. Kind of reminds me of the old Clint Eastwood saying, you know, Man's got to know his limitations. It sounds almost kind of very Greek to me. But there we go. This is kind of the beginnings where, where I started to be interested in, um, in Greek history, and it got me drawing. I started drawing all these pictures, and it probably helped me out in my career as a dentist later on, just because uh, you know, I became somewhat of an artist. And I, I think you would say that this classical world must still be compelling because we see it everywhere. We see it in the movies, TV, um, all kinds of media. They still take these heroes 
and they repackage them and make them into the superheroes we see all the time. I look at all the movies that are out now, all sort of, sort of variations of these Greek heroes. Sometimes there's other cultures. That it's one thing that I hope that we see coming, going forward is different cultures and their stories of heroism and their stories of human nature. We're used to seeing the Greek model. That's just kind of the way that uh, it's been developed. But uh, you know, from these, from these myths, generally, you know, uh, you know, the girl is saved, uh, the monster is killed, um, maybe, the, maybe the city is rescued also. But there was a change that came about in the comics of the 40s and 50s when it became to be more about justice. These superheroes were involved in justice. And that's where we see how, um, you know, the Justice League and, and all the rest of it, it is, is about justice. And finally, in the end, uh, no, who knows, maybe someday we'll be seeing Cyclops Man as the new superhero. Maybe that's coming out to a movie theater near you. Okay, let's get to the architect of my story. What is this story about? What's driving it? And it's a character I call Apollo. Here's a, here's a statue of, uh, from the, sorry, that should say Vatican Museum. And uh, that is a statue of Apollo. Now Apollo is a god who wears many hats um, in the Greek and Roman pantheon. And he is the god, god of the arts. He's the god of archery, medicine, moderation, logic, god of the sun. But the most important um, job he has is he's the god of prophecy. And so Apollo is the driver of the story because he knows what's going to happen in our near future. And he's desperate to stop it. What he knows is going to happen is, is the crushing of our ideals. He knows that all this accumulated civilization that has brought us to the point that we are right now is going to be snuffed out. And he wants to do something to reverse it. For me, it was fun because I got to go on a research trip to go look at all these places and see what they were like. It's always nice as an author to walk the ground with an author's five senses and, and sort of go up there and smell the air and the trees and, and uh, walk the ground. Imagine what went on there at the time that this was the most revered site in the ancient world for for the prophecies of the future. So what is Delphi? Delphi, as we know, is the oracle, famous oracle that people came to for maybe hundreds of miles to hear a prediction of the future that was sort of particular to them because they would petition um, the priests who ran the complex and they would say, I want to know if I should take my family and get on a ship and go start a new colony. Are we going to survive this voyage? Or maybe, you know, should I get involved in this war that's coming up? And it's kind of interesting if you think about it. We're not that different from them. I mean, not recently. We, we, have, we have people who are trying to predict the direction of the stock market. Maybe who's going to win elections? Uh, you know, who's going to win uh, at sports? So we're, maybe we're not that different from them. The thing, the thing about a prophecy or wanting to know the future is people worldwide have all the, of the same sort of uh, dreams and aspirations and fears. You know, we, we all want to move away from pain and towards pleasure. You know, like, look at me. I leave San Diego Padres and come to where the Red Sox, you know, play. So that's a perfect example. So, uh, you know, uh, Delphi is um, the site, and I use the site to move my characters between the past, present, and future. It's a revered site um, because of it being the home of the Oracle, and to this day, people still go to it and kind of feel this sort of uh, this awe when they're there. Uh, but uh, in my story, um, Delphi is reactivated, just maybe not in the way you expect. One thing I want to say about Apollo again, um, you know, he wants to control all the events. 
he, because he's sort of um, the, uh, you know, he, he wants to engineer this rescue, he feels like he wants to have complete control. But we know in life ourselves that we can't have complete control. That would be against nature. There's always fortune and chance. We can't always completely predict the future. So he's got a little bit of a dilemma. And when he's considering what he's going to do to try to save the situation, he's looking at two ways of doing it. And the first comes from the Greek word agape, which means sort of unconditional love. Should he just go ahead and save everything himself and just fix it? But there's another side of it, which maybe as a parent we kind of understand, uh, which is a little bit more of tough love. You need to teach children or people to take care of themselves. Otherwise, they'll make the same mistakes over and over. So he's of the mind that he's going to go in the second direction. He wants to train us to save ourselves. And that's where I bring in the two professors, which are the heroes of my story. They're professors at San Diego State University. And uh, they're, they're in the history department. Uh, the, the male lead, Zach Fletcher, is is a history professor. His wife, Lauren Fletcher, is an ancient languages linguist. They have no idea that they've been selected and drafted to learn the lessons of history in real time, it really is training. So in order to have heroes to help him go through this method of, of saving the near future, he's training his, his, his heroes to be by casting them into the ancient world, into an ancient battle to learn what it took to save really the kernel of, West, of Western civilization early on. As I said, I went on the research trip and uh, went to Athens, went up to Thermopylae where the battle um, took place of 300 Spartans, which we all have probably seen that movie or know about. And that was another interesting place to walk the ground. So I have uh, the two heroes, Zach and Lauren Fletcher, who are the professors who are going to learn the lessons of history in real time. But there's another character who's also sort of in a time not his own. He comes from the ancient world. And he is the character, he's the villain of the story. And he's the character my readers love to hate. His name is Bessus. Bessus comes from the ancient land of Bactria, which today would be Afghanistan in that area, Af Afghanistan, Pakistan. Now, Bessus is a warlord, um, pretty cruel guy, um, concerned with his own needs and wants. And uh, it was interesting for me to develop him because I worked with a psychologist on his character. When you're an author and you're creating a character, um, and especially a villain, you know, villains don't know they're bad. They think they're doing what, just what's right for them. But when you create a villain, they can't be all bad. There has to be something about them, even a sliver of sympathy for why they are the way they are. So Bessus is one of those characters where I went in with, with a psychologist to get into the psychology of why he is, and, uh, why he is um, such a, uh, a cruel person and he does the things that he does in this book. And Bessus uh, is, also has a pedigree, I would tell you, be, and the reason for that is that in the time of Alexander the Great, which is 150 years from the point of this book, Bessus, um, his, I guess his great, 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 great grandson was involved in the killing of the Persian king as Alexander the Great chases the Persian king across uh, towards, um, towards Bactria. His ancestor or, um, or downline kills the Persian king and Alexander the Great does not like that. And you can look in the history what actually happened. So Bessus has, a, has an extreme hate for Persians because of what happened. Um, and you'll, you'll read that in the series. And uh, he doesn't realize that 150 years later, down the, down the road, he's going to get his revenge. Let's see if we can go forward. There's me at the, uh, at the Parthenon. There's the Temple of Apollo at Delphi where the oracles were delivered. That's as close as I got to it because there were rock slides. 
and they blocked it off and wouldn't let us go up any higher. But uh, that is where the Pythia would, uh, would sit in an enclosed room. The ethylene, they, they figured out they were ethylene gases leaking up through the rocks and that would intoxicate her and she would speak all this gibberish and the priests would interpret that as prophecy. Now you gotta remember that this is such an important site, they had their ear out for the whole, the political world that's out there. They knew what was happening because they had people coming in from all around delivering news. And so they would create these cryptic messages um, that could be taken either way. But they were very smart and they were very wealthy. Uh, these are the Twin Peaks, Mount Parnassus, which are, are over the site. This was all covered with, uh, um, over the centuries from uh, rocks falling down and they ended up starting to dig it out in the late 1800s. Okay, very soon here I'm going to play a video um, of this uh, movie um, I want you to see because it has to do with my character Apollo. As, he, as we go through the series, um, he's developing these two heroes, Zack and Lauren, putting them through the, through the gauntlet, I guess you could say, watching them screw up, uh, make bad decisions, uh, unintended consequences of their decisions, um, get into trouble, um, you know, barely stay alive at times. And all along he's watching them to see if they survive. Are they smart enough or tough enough um, to complete their training so they can be of use to him? And he has to approach them with a bit of detachment. You know, I, I want to see if you're going to make it, and if you don't make it, I'm going to have to find somebody else. And so he's got, a, he's got a particular problem here as he starts to see them become the heroes he wants them to be. And is he going to start caring too much about them? And so I want to play you this clip from this movie, which they showed us in training in the Navy uh, to be an officer and to maybe be a commanding officer of a unit. And it's about leader, leadership and management styles. And so there's a, point, there's a poignant uh, clip here I want to play for you. If you have ever seen this movie before, anybody ever seen this movie? One of the better movies, you should uh, you know, look it up and watch it. Um, Gregory Peck, 1949. It is about the early days of World War II when our bomber crews were going over France and Germany and they were getting shot out of the sky and they had a great uh, number of losses and it's about this unit that, this bomber unit that Gregory Peck has brought in to take over because the previous commanding officer is kind of at the end of his rope. His people are all getting killed, he's getting too involved with them to the point that now he can't run the unit. He kind of, he's kind of had it. And so Gregory Peck comes in to take over this unit and he has to come in with the detachment that this guy lost. Okay, the previous commanding officer. So let's see if I can manipulate this to work. So he marches in, this is his first day on the job and he's gonna tell these guys. Be a briefing for a practice mission at 1100 this morning. That's right, practice. I've been sent down here to take over what has come to be known as a hard luck group. Well, I don't believe in hard luck. So we're going to find out what the trouble is. Maybe part of it's your flying, so we're going back to fundamentals. But I can tell you now one reason I think you've been having hard luck. I saw it in your faces last night. I can see it there now. You've been looking at a lot of air lately. You think you ought to have a rest. In short, you're sorry for yourselves. Now, I don't have a lot of patience with this what are we fighting for stuff. We're in a war, a shooting war. We've got to fight. And some of us have got to die. Now, I'm not trying to tell you not to be afraid. Fear is normal. But stop worrying about it and about yourselves. Stop making plans. Forget about going home. Consider yourselves already dead. Once you accept that idea, it won't be so tough. Now, if any man here can't buy that, if he rates himself as something special, with a special kind of hide to be saved, he'd better make up his mind about it right now. Because I don't want him in this group. I'll be 
be in my office in five minutes. You can see me there. Check. So this is the problem my character Apollo has. He's training his heroes. He's approaching them with a bit of detachment, but he knows that there's a battle coming. And as time goes on and we get into this third book, Journey from Delphi, the question is, is what is he going to do when the time comes to sacrifice them? So I think that's a great movie. I think it's worth watching the whole thing. If you've ever seen it, he comes in, he takes care of that unit and um, he goes in and he try, he flies all the missions and he starts to develop his own problem. Okay, so my characters, uh, as I said, have, have, go through a great deal of training. I want to tell you about uh, my, back to my character Bessus, he's from Bactria, that gives you an idea where that is. He also uh, grew up in an area called the Tora Bora. If you happen to remember that, that place, that's where Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden hid out after when they uh, retreated east and we sent our B-52s in to bomb that area. Um, so Bessus has a wide knowledge of all the caves in that area. Okay, as an author, I get to play with all these different plot points. And one of the plot points you can look for is a perfume that my character Lauren Fletcher wears. This is an older, I, I, I know they still make it. I don't know how many, <laughs> how often uh, people love J'adore now, but that's her port perfume. And when she ends up at the Battle of Thermopylae, she's dabbing it under her nose to keep the stench of the battle um, uh, is, is what, how she's able to deal with it. But, it, as it, but also what happens is it gives her away because she wears it, um, um, it gives her away and uh, my character Bessus uh, feels that he's been wronged by her and he wants nothing more to snuff her out and sometimes it gives away. Look for that perfume, I've got that kind of worked into different parts of the plot in different places and it's, it's important. Okay, my characters still go through training and my, and my character Zach, uh, especially in this third book, he's gonna end up in Santorini. This is another place I got to do uh, some research. Look at that, isn't that great? Restaurant right on the water. Does it make you wanna go there? I'm gonna show you this next slide. It's gonna make you wanna go there even more. Watch this. This is the caldera. This is where the volcano exploded and uh, and look at this, Santo Winery. On the day I was there, there was hardly anybody there. You go off season and you can sit there. Is that the best winery in the world it's gotta be, right? Look at that. So why Santorini? What's interesting about it? It's not just a vacation spot. And the reason is, is because there was a civilization on the island of Santorini uh, and you might consider it the Pompeii of the Greek world because around 1600 BC, the volcano exploded and pretty much wiped out the area. Um, luckily for the people of Santorini, they had earthquakes and they kind of got hint that this was coming and they evacuated because they don't find skeletons there like they do at Pompeii where they had no warning or very little warning. So they had time to evacuate. But there is a city there, well, the remains, we'll call it a town, uh, it's called Akrotiri, and that's where they're still digging today and uncovering uh, as they find out more and more about this civilization. And the next slide I'm going to show you is, is one of what they're finding on the walls, either in Crete or in Santorini. Take a look at that. That's probably from 1800 BC. Look at the, the beauty and the grace of these three women. Does that look like an interesting culture? This is probably what a, uh, uh, a guy looked like back in, in that time. And uh, if you've read my book and you're, you're into the first two books, you know that my character Apollo has a forelock. And now you know where it comes from because he was interested in the Minoan civilization too. And so Apollo wears a forelock, just not one quite as long as that. 
They're known for their bull jumpers. When you see a dark figure, that's a male, and probably the lighter figures are female. But that was one of the sports uh, back in that time, and they revered bulls. Bulls were sacred. And as we know, as I was just saying, Santorini did um, what's called thera back then. It did explode. Uh, and they think that this probably is the most likely um, reason for the legend of Atlantis because it was advanced, it was in the area, and there was a thriving civilization that, that was trading with Egypt and all the other different countries down in the Levant, the area around Israel and Palestine and, and up and down the coast. So, uh, you know, in the end, this was a... Uh, uh, pretty incredible place if you go there. You can see what they have in their museums and uh, visit, visit the remains of Akrotiri. As we know, Mount St. Helens, um, that we had our own little uh, explosion back in 1980 uh, that did quite a bit of damage. They say that the explosion on Santorini was probably the loudest noise ever heard by human ears. Maybe except for uh, when they knocked out the Yankees in 2004, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, there was more um, dirt and debris thrown into the atmosphere. They, they thought that Krakatoa was maybe one of the largest volcanoes that ever exploded in the 1800s in Indonesia. And this far exceeded it, Akrotiri and uh, Santorini. So I want to get now a little bit into technology. Back in the ancient world, this was the height of technology. These ships and the crews were what helped to preserve uh, the kernel of, uh, of Western culture and maybe even the beginnings of democracy back then. And this was the height of technology of the town. Three oars, a bronze ram, it's called a trireme, archers on the top, and then marines on the deck who would, uh, once they rammed the ship, the marines would jump on board, take over the other ship. And we know this from the Battle of Salamis, uh, which was also in the Persian Wars. The period that my characters are sent back to is the Persian Wars and the important battles of Thermopylae, Salamis, and Plataea. And so it's fun for me to take my modern day characters and throw them back into war to see what happens with them. Okay, so look at today. How important is it to be, to have the best technology right now uh, this is our submarine launched ballistic missiles. And I want to mention just recently we had a successful test of our anti-ballistic missiles. And uh, the SM-3s were just proven to work. Um, we do not have foolproof uh, missile technology against missiles. And so it's uh, nice to see that one of them did work in testing. So in the end, um, what are we saving? You know, what is it that um, Apollo is trying to save? What, what values are we saving? As you look at the Lincoln Memorial, look at the Parthenon. We know that the Lincoln Memorial is a copy of the Parthenon. And in the Parthenon was dedicated to the goddess Athena. The Lincoln Mor Memorial is really a temple to our commitment to justice. All right, what did we learn from Martin Luther King? There is equality within the Constitution. Here's Pericles. What do we learn from him in the, the, the golden age of, of Athens and Greece and the beginnings of democracy back then? And maybe what we learn from him is the disasters of empire in unnecessary war. Because of all the advances of Athens' golden age, what happened is, is Athens and Sparta went to war and they destroyed each other. And he was alive in the first year of the per Peloponnesian War, but when the Spartans surrounded Athens and they were protected by their walls, they were enclosed and the ships were still coming in and they brought the plague with it. And he died in the first year of the war and they never had another commander as good as Pericles. And um, eventually Athens lost the Peloponnesian War and Sparta, Sparta took over. So back to uh, the modern day and having, 
having uh, the height of technology and weapons. Today we're, we're developing these laser weapons, which will be used to uh, initially maybe against drones, but maybe eventually to do more for us as they're loaded on our naval ships and maybe uh, on, on shore installations also. What do we learn from Benjamin Franklin? How is liberty gained and how is liberty held? You know, at the end when they uh, decided on the Constitution, a lady asked him, what did we get? And he said, a republic if you can hold it. Something along those lines. All right, so as I get to the, the journey from Delphi in this third book, I'm asking some questions. Um, you know, there's a famous historian, Ariel Durant, and he said, a great civilization is not conquered from without until it is conquered from within. Pretty interesting statement. I'm looking at Apollo and our heroes. You know, how are they going to figure out this clandestine threat that's coming in our near future and how are they going to stop it? And what are they going to be willing to do to stop it? I'm asking other questions. What is the future going to bring as we, as we advance in technology, we, uh, in biology, medicine, all these grand technologies that are just moving faster and faster, information technology also. And, you know, we love these conveniences, you know, but are they all good? I mean, look at these cell phones that we have all the time. They're kind of attached to us now. And, and uh, you know, it used to be you had a penny, you had a loafer, you put a diamond so you could make a phone call. Then it was a quarter, all right? Then you got beepers, you know, but you still had to find a phone. Now we got the cell phones. Uh, and they're, they're bigger, but sometimes you need your glasses to read the cell phone, you know, so you, you lose your phone, you lose your, your glasses, and, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, but, you know, we, we love these conveniences. And uh, what is the future bringing? Are, are, are all these advances good, you know, for the good of mankind? Look at video games, you know, where you save the virtual world at the expense of the real world. And all these advances, are they going to be used for what they're intended? I'm going to tell you the story of Thomas Migley, who was in, in the early 1900s. He was hired by GM to fix the problem with gasoline because engines knocked. And he fixed it by putting lead in the gasoline. And so for decades, we had leaded gas and, you know, spewing into the atmosphere. He ended up getting lead poison a couple times. When he recovered, they put him on a new project. They said, we need you to develop something that will help us with air conditioning and uh, refrigerators. So he and his scientists developed Freon. All right? And then the, eventually there was an environmental historian who said that this guy, Thomas Migley, had more impact on the atmosphere than any other single organism in Earth's history. All right? So, so what about this? unintended consequences of, of inventions and will we, will we have time to, to uh, you know, to decide what's good and what isn't. So I want to tell you in the end, this story is about a couple who go through extraordinary circumstances to realize how much they mean to each other. And this is set against a struggle for our way of life in the near future. All right. As, as, as they are trained by Apollo, who has, has selected and drafted them, you know, there's a change. Because once they understand what's at risk, they turn from draftees to volunteers. And so they're more committed. So I, at this point, would like to say thanks for listening to everything I've had to say here to tell you about the series and the background for what I'm doing with it. One thing I do want to say, if you can, an author always needs reviews. It's probably the single most you know, important thing after you read a book. Put a review up. Put it on Amazon, Goodreads, wherever you can, because reviews are like gasoline in the tank for us. Um, and it's important to leave them. They don't have to be much. They can be a couple sentences. Don't have to say a lot as long as it's there. You can say you loved it or you, you know, used it to fly, you know, the SWAT flies, whatever, whatever you want to say. <laughs> Uh, you can keep in touch with me as soon as we get this up or on those cards there. Um, it has my website and I'm on Facebook. Um, I do quite a bit of radio shows in different parts of the country. Uh, you can look up, it's called Patches of History. Um, they're in different uh, archives. 
Um, I will take historical events and relate it to something to the present day. So yeah, leave a review on Amazon. It's not hard to do. You just go, you know, if you go to my first book, Passages of Delphi, and you read it, and, and on Amazon, down the bottom, they'll say, would you like to leave a review? And you can just leave a review there. Uh, there's some information. Uh, the Ray Carr Show is in archives that I'm, that I'm in. I'm going to be out there in a couple days um, talking there as well. And the Patches of History of Radio segments. And uh, you can always, uh, uh, Facebook probably is the best place to uh, watch what I do. Okay, for the hikers, here we go. Recent trip to Zion National Park. If you ever get to go, this is the hike that you want to go on. Uh, those statistics now are, are, are far more, um, but this is called Angel's Landing. There's quite a hike to get there, and then you have to climb up this long, winding, very steep set of rocks. What's interesting about it is uh, this is an area where there weren't many people, but most of the time when we were there, there's people coming down while you're going up, so you're kind of grabbing the chain while they're going around them, and there's hundreds of feet, like right here, so you have to hold on very tight while these people are coming down, you're going up. But when you get to the top, you get that kind of view. Beautiful place, I recommend it, just don't go don't go on season, go, go off season, because there are a lot of crowds. So there's my family, as my wife Nancy and my son Alex and my daughter Lauren. Alex just graduated from UC Davis in chemical engineering. My daughter is an art student at UC Santa Barbara. And we live out in San Diego, and thank you for listening to my talk and uh, any support for this novel series. <laughs>